seek this out in their life, but we all desire this. What is that? Well, that is to be wanted and to be loved. Whether you seek it out or not, all of us deep down desire it. We all desire to be wanted and to be loved. So we all seek someone, therefore, to give us just that in this life. If you're married, that's what you look for. If you're dating, that's what you look for. Someone who wants you and loves you. Now, we, we have been on a journey on this book called Genesis, the first book of our Bible. If you, if you don't read this book, if you don't understand this book, you won't understand the rest of the Bible. It won't make sense to you. So it's so important for us to, to read this and to study this and to learn about this first book of our Bible. And we've been on this journey for three months now. We still have a couple more months to go. Um, it's just about to get exciting, isn't it? It's, you know, the plot twist in this chapter 29, for example. So, Jake, where, where, where have we been? Where, where are we on, on the book of Genesis? For those of you who just join us. Jacob, our main character in chapter 29, is on the run from his twin brother, um, Esau. Jacob and Esau, the twins, run from his brother who is seeking to kill him. We learned that last week. Why did he run? Why did his brother want to kill him? Because Jacob cheated his older brother by a few minutes, a few seconds perhaps. They're twins after all. Jacob cheated him of his birthright. And not only that, deceived their father to get the blessing of the firstborn. Deceive his blind father. So Jacob was on the run. Why did Jacob did all this? What did he do all this for? He was longing to be accepted because his father favored his older brother, the firstborn. Jacob was longing to be loved. While he was all alone last week on the field, sleeping under the stars with a stone as his pillow, remember that? The Lord appeared to him. He didn't seek God. He was on the run, but God sought him out. And God said this, because this is important for us to set the context. Genesis 28, this was last week. Verse 15, it says, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, the promised land. Okay, For I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. So that's what God said. He did not seek God. God came to him. That was God's grace for Jacob. Now, is that enough? God appeared to him. God's presence, God's promise. Is that enough? Is God's promise enough for Jacob? Is God's promise in your life enough is the question. So here in Genesis 29, Jacob had reached his uncle Laban's, his mother's, his mother's brother, uh, Laban's home, and Jacob saw Laban's beautiful daughter, Rachel, by the well coming, and Jacob wanted her. She was beautiful, it was described, and Jacob wanted Rachel. So Jacob believed Rachel finally his emptiness, wanting to be loved, wanting to be wanted, will finally be filled. This emptiness in him. Like Jacob, we too may be longing for someone to want us and to love us, to make us feel special. So we're going to look at this chapter 29 of Genesis. We're going to look at under three headings. Very simple this morning. What we seek in this life and what we get in this life and what we have in this life. Okay, what we seek, what we get, and what we have. Okay, what we seek is this. Um, that sense of longing and wanting to be loved, right? So where, where are we? Jacob has been on, actually, it's a month-long journey, even though in our, in our Bible, it's actually a verse. You say he just reached there. So we look at verse 1. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. Just like almost magically, he was there, right? In one verse. But it was a month-long journey, it, it's actually about, I calculate the distance, it's about Melbourne to Sydney. It's about 650, 700 kilometers. He didn't have a car. He didn't have a donkey. He didn't have a camel. He was on foot. But the verse just says he's there. Okay? So remember, God promised him not only a land, but offspring as numerous as the dust of the earth. That was God's promise to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. The reality is, it's quite the opposite. 
to the promise of God. Jacob had nobody, let alone offspring as numerous as the dust of the earth. He was far away from home, away from the promised land. He had lost everything and everyone when he tried so hard to grab everything that he can grab. His brother's blessing, the firstborn blessing. So when Jacob looked up and saw a beautiful girl, he wanted her. Now, the world we live in, this is the world we live in, no difference. The, the world we live in wants the strong, wants the beautiful, right? If you are big and tall, in fact, they did a survey that the average high, height of CEOs around the world is high, taller than average. They didn't even look at skills, just look at appearance. The first king of Israel was chosen. They like him. Why? Because he's taller than the rest. The world loves the strong and the beautiful. That's the world that we live in. Jacob came to seek a wife. He came with a purpose. Now he might have hit a jackpot as he looked up and he saw a beautiful Rachel. At least that's what he thought, that he hit a jackpot. Because there's a plot twist. Didn't, 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 haven't we noticed that? When, when the Bible was read for us. Let's look at verse 13 and 14. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, Laban is his uncle, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Jacob told Laban all these things. We're not told what is all these things are that he told, but the response gives us a clue. Because the response, Laban said to him, surely you are my bone and my flesh, and he stayed with him for a month. So whatever he told him, Laban basically say, you are a cut from the same cloth. You are just like me. So we could assume what he told him is like what he had done to his brother and how he deceived his own father. How he was cunning in getting what he wanted. And Laban said, you are just like me, the kind of guy, my kind of guy. That's what Laban is saying. So Laban ran to meet him, right? The Bible says, why is he so eager? This is supposed to be a stranger. They never met. Why is he so eager to meet him? Remember, Laban did the same thing back in Genesis 24, many years ago when Abraham's servant, Jacob's grandfather, sent his servant to the same place to look for a wife for Isaac, Jacob's father. Remember that? He ran out also to meet um, the servant. So that's in back Genesis 24. Let's, let's remind us again what it says. Rebecca, in verse 29, Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban. So this is five chapters back, okay? Laban ran out to the man, to the offspring. As soon as he saw the ring, when did he run? As soon as he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's arm. He ran and heard the words, uh, the words of Rebekah, his sister, thus the man spoke to me. He went to the man, and behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. This man is rich. He got bracelets. He got, ring, you know, he got gold. He got camels. Camels are for rich people. He got many of those, and he ran. Perhaps now he ran because he was hoping that Jacob came also with much gold and camels. Remember? Jacob came on foot. He had nothing. He had lost everything. He was a fugitive. He's on the run. He saw Jacob and he knows right away he's dirt poor. He must have been disappointed. That's why we read that Jacob had to explain himself, explain all these things, because Laban must have said, what happened? Where are the gold? Where are the... You don't travel in those days if you have money with no servants and nothing with you. And then he had to explain all these things. How he had gotten his brother's birthright, now how he cheated and deceived his own father. This is where Laban then said, oh, you're just like me. Surely you're my bone and my flesh. So deceiving is what they're good at. Laban and Jacob. This is their skills. So if they have a CV on the skill section, deceiving people. That's number one number one trait. They're really good at it. So Laban then made an offer, knowing that ah, there's this desperate guy, right? There's this desperate kid, my, my sister's son. He's dirt poor. 
love my daughter. I can use this guy, and he's, he's strong. He rolled a big stone off the well on his own. He's strong, and he's been staying with him for, for a month. So he's seen this, right? So he's seen how good Jacob is. So Laban said in verse 15 to Jacob, because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me what shall your wages be. Now this is a masterful move by a master deceiver. He had been taking advantage of Jacob's labor for a month before he offered this. Jacob's been staying with him for a month, no pay, and now he said he, he, he basically did a test drive. Like if you want to buy a car, you did a test drive. But you don't test drive for a month. He did a test drive for a month. I said, I like this, and then make an offer. He said, okay, you shouldn't work for nothing, right? Tell me what your wages be, because you've seen what Jacob can do. He's an asset. Now, verse 16, it says, Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Now, first of all, no one really knows what weak eyes mean. No one really knows. Either it's like Asian eyes, you know, like... You know what I mean? Um, barely seen. When you laugh, it, they disappear. Or, you know, back in the days, they don't have glasses. Probably she can't see far. No one really knows. However, the context might help us. Because it doesn't say Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel's eyes were strong. Or Rachel's eyes were big. Or Rachel's could see well. He didn't say that. The contrast is, but Rachel's was beautiful in form and appearance. Rachel had all these things that Leah does not. So we can gather from the context what does it mean for Leah to have a weak, to have weak eyes. Okay? There's no ambiguity there, right? So one have weak eyes, the other but. It's a but. Contrast beautiful in form and appearance. So Jacob's offer this beautiful Rachel seven years of his labor, which is ridiculously generous by any standard in those days. It is at least, the scholars say, two or three times the going rate for a bright price in those days. Two or three times. Because he wanted what he saw. He loved Rachel. So he said, I, I don't want to give any room for bargaining here. And we can also know how generous this offer by the master deceiver, Laban's response, right? How did Laban respond? He said, it is better that I give her to you than that than that I should give her to any other man, so stay with me. So it tells you how generous it is because Laban, even the master deceiver, say, deal, like he couldn't wait to shake his hand. Seven years, perfect, where do I sign? That's basically what he said. So Laban knows what he's getting. He, he, you can't cheat Laban, right? This is the master deceiver. So he said, this is basically what can we, then we can conclude what these seven years of labor means. Uh, Jacob basically said, I will give you everything if only I can have your daughter, Rachel. So Jacob served, in verse 20, seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of love, of the love he had for her. Seven years felt only like a few days for Jacob. Those of you who are in love, you know what that means. I don't have to explain that. For some of you been married for a long time, perhaps this is the opposite, right? Seven minutes feel like seven years, and that's not supposed to be. That's not supposed to be. I, every time I tell sitting down with uh, young couples who are to be married, I said, some people, the world will, will tell you lies. Like, you know, on the day of your wedding, that's the most beautiful day. That's the perfect day, and everything else from then on will going downhill. That's not biblical. The biblical view of marriage is it's going to get more and more beautiful. So the longer you've been married, you sh your relationship should be sweeter and more beautiful than ever before. So if people ask you, how's your relationship with your spouse today? Well, it's better than yesterday. It's better than a year ago. Much better than 10 years ago. So for Jacob, a few years, seven years feels like only a few days. Now, this is no coincidence 
that it says it only felt like a few days because back in 27, when he was sent away by his mother, his mother said this, now therefore, in Genesis 27, now therefore, my son, obey my voice, arise, flee to Laban, my brother in Haran, and stay with him a while until your brother's fury turns away. Now that word's a while, stay with him a while, is the same Hebrew word as staying for a few days. So it feels like, okay, now I fulfill what my mother asked me. I stay a few days. Now I got Rachel. I worked for seven years, but felt just like a while, a short while. So how do you deal with the emptiness in your life? Is I want to ask you, the way Jacob deal is like he wanted Rachel, the beautiful daughter of Laban. Now, whether we realize or not, you and I are the same. We too wanted Rachel, quote-unquote Rachel, in our life. The difference is our Rachel, the form of our Rachel. Whether you're a girl or a guy, married or not married, young and old, we all wanted Rachel. We don't want Leah. If we have Leah in our life, we want to get rid of her. We wanted Rachel. We seek for beautiful Rachel in our life. Perhaps your form of Rachel is approval from your parents. So you made it your mission to prove your worth to them. You gave everything up in your life. You pursue your best for your Rachel. Seven years was like a few days. You tell yourself it's only temporary. All these things that I do, it's going to be a few days only. But seven years passed. Before you know it, you're so entrenched. You're so deep in it, yet you don't know how to get out of it. All you know in life is how to please people, to get people's approval in your life. If that's your Rachel that you seek, See, we all seek to fill the hole of emptiness in our life. All of us. All of us do that. We seek to fill it with something in our life. We seek our own version of Rachel. But the question we all must ourself, ask ourselves is this. Those of you who have been doing this, pursuing your quote-unquote Rachel, all of us then must ask ourselves this question. Is it worth it? Or if you're on a journey, you're just beginning on this journey to seek your own version of Rachel, you must ask this, will it be worth it to pursue this? That leads us to our second point, what we get. So that's what we seek. So what we get. Okay. We think we did a beautiful Rachel, right, Jacob? For us, it could be fame, it could be recognition, it could be wealth, it could be a comfortable life, just a simple, comfortable life where you don't have to worry about job, paycheck, that you don't have to worry about paying mortgage, that you don't have to worry about these things. You just want a simple life, house paid off, you got mo enough money in the bank for you to just live a normal, easy life. Perhaps that's your Rachel. For Jacob, all he wanted was a beautiful Rachel, and he gave it all for Rachel. Was it worth it for him? Was it worth it? Let's read from verse 21. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife after seven years. Give me my wife that I may go into her for my time is completed. This is as brush as it could be. Give me my wife, Rachel, that I may sleep with her. That's what he says. For my time is complete. For I've done what I said I will do for you. So Laban, no argument here. He said, gather together. Notice, seven years is done. Laban didn't say, hey, thank you for your service. It's all done. He pretended nothing had happened. He just keep it quiet. Maybe, maybe, hopefully, Jacob forget that during seven years. Maybe Jacob thought it's still only five years. Maybe he's going to do for another two years or something like that. But no, he keep it quiet. Jacob had to approach him. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter, not Rachel, but Leah, and brought her to Jacob. But he went, and he went into her. He slept with her. Laban gave his female servant, Zilpah, to his daughter, Leah, to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah! Exclamation mark. Okay? Don't miss that. And Jacob said, it was a, <gasps> like that. That's the exclamation mark. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel. Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, 
It is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. In fact, this is a stab for Jacob because that's exactly what Jacob did towards his brother. And Laban have heard this story. And Laban said, you may have done that back home with your brother and to your dad, but we don't do that here. We, we, don't, we don't give out, you know, the younger before the older. The, the elders always come first. He basically said, Esau always come first. You, Jacob, you are the second son. You don't deserve to come first. That's what he's saying. He said, we don't do that here in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. So complete the week for this one, of this one, Leah. And we will give you the other also in return for another seven years. Can you imagine? It's like you, you go in a showroom and say, how much is this Ferrari cost? You say a million dollars, okay? You pay a million dollars, you get a Honda for your million dollars. You say, ah, oh, we can't give you that before you learn how to drive, right? Now you know how to drive Honda. We'll, we'll give you uh, the one million dollar um, Ferrari, but for another million dollars. So he got Leah for seven years that Jacob willing to serve seven years for Rachel. That's clever. Well, from Laban's point of view anyway. He said, work for me another seven years. So Jacob did so. This is amazing writing, right? There's no argument. It's just clear that he wanted Rachel. He didn't say, that is so unfair. I had enough. I don't want this anymore. I'm out of here. No, he said, I'll do it. So did so and complete her week. And then Laban gave his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went in also, slept also with Rachel, and he loved Rachel more than Leah and served Laban for another seven years. Fourteen years for Rachel. Not for Leah. He didn't want Leah. He worked at 14 years. Seven years was generous offer, two, three times the going rate. Now he worked 14 years for Rachel. All the things that you pursue in life that you think will fill the emptiness in your life will always ask more of you than what you're willing to give. Always. You think it's going to be a short while, it's going to be a temporary sacrifice, but no, it will always ask for more. Now, Rachel was the beautiful one. We know that. But Leah, on the other hand, was not beautiful Nobody wanted her. Nobody wanted her. She needed to be given away secretly. Even given away for free, if it's not in secret, nobody wanted her. Have you tried giving away something in your life? It's usually easy. It's free. A couple of years ago, I moved house, right? There are things that I put on Facebook Marketplace that I put a price. Just say, whatever price, ridiculously low, like $5, $10. No one wants it. But as soon as you say it's free, right, you got people competing with you, like competing with each other, pleading with you, right? Uh, I, for my TV, I gave away my TV, and this guy write me an essay why he should get it. It's like, you know, my mother-in-law just moved in with us, you know, she's now living in the granny flat, and she needs a TV. It would be great if you, like, because it's free. But Leah, even when she's free, it's like, man, just marry her. Nobody wanted her. She has to be given away in secret. So what a shock then and a disappointment it must be for Jacob in the morning to find Leah instead of Rachel. That's why the exclamation mark, right? The very important exclamation, and it was Leah in the morning. When you're drunk, like Jacob, you won't know what has hit you until the morning. When he woke up from his drunkenness, he realized he had wasted seven years. He was so mad, he stormed straight to Laban. He said, what have you done? That's when Laban said, well, we don't do that here. You may do that in your home, but we don't do that here. You can have Rachel work for me another seven years. But notice when, when Jacob asks, I will work for you seven years for your daughter, Rachel. Laban never say yes, did he? This is what Laban say. 
in verse 19. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. So stay with me. So when he said, I work for you seven years for Rachel, Laban didn't say yes. Laban said, well, it's better for, for her to be with you. So yeah, stay with me. No yes. He's a shrewd person. So Jacob had wanted Rachel. He got Leah. I'm going to give you a quote um, by one of the probably best Jewish scholar that I love to read from and learn from by the name of Robert Alter. And he quoted a rabbi's, Jewish rabbi's observation of this account, of this passage. He said, imagine Jacob's conversation with Leon the next morning on the bed. I woke up. Why didn't he realize, you may ask? Well, they, they wore well, obviously, until they are alone in their bedroom. But then by then, Jacob was already drunk, and it was dark, you know. Thomas Alpha Edison wasn't born. There's no light. And, um, and they say, imagine the conversation then in the morning after he was awake and look at his bride. He said, imagine that. And Jacob would say to Leah, this is imagination. He said, I call out, this is Jacob, right, saying to Leah, I call out for Rachel in the dark at night. But you answered, Leah answered, why did you do that to me? Why did you deceive me at night? Oh, Rachel. And he said, yes. That's what Leah responded. He said, why did you do that? And Leah said to him, well, your father called out in the dark because he can't see. Your father called out Esau. And why did you answer? Yes, father. He said, I didn't do more than what you have done. Because that's what exactly he had done to his father. So Jacob, a deceiver, now has met his match in Laban. Jacob deceived his father, and I was deceived by his father-in-law. So in this life, if you are chasing Rachel, this is what happened. Come in the morning, you will not get Rachel. What you will get is Leah. What does that mean? It means this. Whatever in this world, that offer you anything that the world offers, it will never live up to its promises. You may think that's what you need in this life. You may think if I have a spouse that loves me, you may think if I have a child that I can love, if, if you think if I have this beautiful home that, I've owned, that I own, if only my children would grow up to be a good, kind person, a Christian, loving God, loving God and serving God, if only, whatever it is that you chase in your life, Whatever the world is offering you, it will never live up to its promises. Not only do we want to get Rachel, quote-unquote Rachel, we want to be Rachel, don't we? Any of us here, when we read that, oh, I want to be like Leah, unwanted, undesirable, that my father has to kind of give me away secretly, promising people that I'm, I'm such and such, but I'm just a disappointment. We too want to be Rachel, we want to be beautiful, we want to be loved, we want to be wanted. Nobody here want to be Leah. But what if you possess none of those that Rachel possess? What if you are not strong? What if you are not beautiful? What if all your life you are unwanted, unloved? What if? Now, let me say this. Even if you're beautiful now, how, how physically beautiful? Girls uh, and men physically fit, six-pack, how long do you think that will last? Even if you're beautiful, it won't be lasting forever. Even if you're strong, you'll be weakened one day. Even if you're smart, if that's what you are on about, I'm not about beautiful... Uh, beauty on the outside, I'm about beauty on the inside, but I'm a smart person. How long do you think your smart mind will stay with you? See, when you seek the blessings instead of the one who gives the blessing, when you make the good thing in your life to be the ultimate things in your life, when you put anything at the top of your priority instead of God, in place of God, you will be disappointed. You will wake up one day and find Leah instead of Rachel. So in the morning, 
when you open your eyes, do not be surprised if that is what you seek in your life. Don't put exclamation mark and say, oh, because you know that's coming. You know that's coming. So number three, what we have. As you can see, because it's not my computer, my computer is dead. Uh, what we have is the final point. This story in Genesis 29, it's, it's really one messed up story. Interesting to read, plot twists and all that, but it's a messed up story. When you read a Bible, you usually say, oh, I want to be like David. Such a great guy, right? You read these, there's no one person who says, oh, I want to be like, you don't want to be like Rachel. You don't want to be like Laban. You don't want to be like Jacob. You, don't, you definitely don't want to be like Leah, right? So what's it? There's no good character in this for you to imitate, for us to imitate. It's like, I want to be like that. It's just messed up. But God used all, them, all of them. Do you see? Do you notice? God is holding the strings. He's sovereign over all these messed up people. God did not put an exclamation mark and say, oops, Leah? Wow, Laban? Really? I didn't see that coming. That was clever. God knows. He used this. So Genesis 29, verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, God saw. He opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For he said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction. For now my husband will love me, even when he's, he's married. She's married. So Jacob, Jacob does not, did not love her. That's why he said, now I have Reuben. Perhaps now my husband Jacob will love me. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I'm hated. Hated by her own husband. Not just unloved but hate it. And say, perhaps now I will have my husband love. And she called his name Simeon. And again, she conceived and bore a son and said, now this time, perhaps this time, my husband will be attached to me. And because I have borne him three sons, and therefore his name was called Levi. And she said, and she conceived again and bore a son, and she said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. And she ceased bearing. Now, you know where I get my, my kid's name from now. Um, so, if I have more sons, then there's four sons there, and there are two, so I use two out of four, okay? Your wife, your husband, your career, your children, they can never save you. That's what Leah tried to do. She thought by, by giving birth to these sons, to Jacob, she will finally get the approval, the love that she ever that she longed for in her life. But no. Now, Leah, the girl that nobody wanted, not even by, not by his own father, right? Now, if you, have a, if you are a father, some of you are a father here, I know you love your son, but if you're a father and you have a daughter, you know. A daughter will always have a special place in your heart. If you have more than one daughter, then God is especially kind to you. Even the father does not love Leah. The father doesn't want Leah, want to get rid of Leah, secretly even. And he's not loved and wanted by, his own hus by her own husband, Jacob. But it says here, but God did not forget Leah. Everyone may not love you and want you and forget about you, but God will always remember you. So don't miss that verse. It says, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. God will never forget Leah. Do you see the difference in the progressions of, of first son, second son? It says, first son, now my husband will love me, Reuben. Second son, Simeon, because the Lord has heard me that I'm hated. He has given me this son also. And the third son, now this time my husband will be attached to me because I have borne him three sons. They are the same thing, right? Up to three sons. All she wanted is her husband to love her and want her. She hasn't learned after three sons. Only after three sons she learned. And the fourth son, Judah, this time I will praise the Lord. Then she sees 
bearing. She desires her husband's approval and love. She longs to be wanted, but she remains empty until Judah. Until Judah, Leah puts her hope not in her husband anymore. So I don't care. Now I will praise the Lord. That's our key there. If you try to fill this longing, this desire in your heart with anything else but God, you will always find Leah. You will always be disappointed in the morning. So God chose Leah, the unwanted, the unloved, not Rachel. The priests will come from the line of Leah's third son, Levi. All the priests must be a Levite. The king, David, also comes from the sons, the line of the sons of um, Leah, Judah. That's King David. And the king of kings, the savior, King Jesus, will also come from the line of Judah, the fourth son of Leah, the unloved, the unwanted. Our Lord Jesus Christ. God remembered. God chose Leah, not Rachel. But we seek Rachel. We seek to be Rachel. We want to be like Rachel. We want to get Rachel. But again and again in the Bible, God always chose Leah. Leah comes in, comes in different form, in different names in the Bible. But he always chose Leah over Rachel. Now, you and I, we are all Leah. You and I, we are all Leah wanting to be like Rachel. Until we find the Lord God. In fact, it's not that you and I have found Him, really. It's actually Him who found us. Just like in verse 31 there, it says, When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, it was God who found Leah. Leah didn't look for God. God sought out Leah. So when the Lord, Leah was wanted, unwanted, he loved her. And this is what the gospel is all about, isn't it? Love for the unwanted and the unloved. The gospel reaches, reaches so down, so deep down to save the weak. The gospel reaches down, how? By sending Jesus from heaven for you and I. Rachel's wannabes, even though we are all Leah's, he sent his son Jesus, the king of kings, from the line of Judah. He was rejected, oh Lord, he was unwanted, even by his own disciples, people that stay with him, eat with him every day, know him intimately, personally, for three years every day. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver. He was denied, the disciple denied of ever knowing him when he needed them the most. They swore that they did not know Jesus. They crucified him. His own people crucified him. And this is how the prophet Isaiah described Jesus' appearance that resembled Leah more than Rachel's. Isaiah 53, for he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of a dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He's not like Rachel. He's like Leah. He was despised and rejected by men, just like Leah. A man of sorrow and acquainted with grief, just like Leah. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and he was esteemed him not. Jesus came to the world rejected and unwanted. And yet, what we seek in this world is we want to be like Rachel. We want to seek Rachel. Our Lord, King of Kings, came down to be like Leah, not Rachel. So when you feel unwanted, when you feel this emptiness, when you seek this love from this world, remember that our Lord came to the world rejected and unwanted. When you're going through what you're going through, He knows what you're going through. Not only He sees what you're going through, He's been there. He experienced what you experience because of the gospel, because of Jesus, because of the cross where He was crushed, because He was rejected even by His own Father on the cross. 
Oh Lord Jesus Christ cried out, Daddy, help me out here. He was silent from heaven. He was rejected by his own father. So that you and I, you may feel like Leah, but to God, because of what Christ has done on the cross, he was crossed and rejected by his own father. Because of that, you may feel like Leah, but to him, our Father in heaven, you will always be like Rachel. What a hope. What a love. What a Savior. Let us pray.